Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Babcock, and welcome to Lecture 5, Communicating Biblical Law. Now, this is an, a, a deep and um, complicated topic, uh, and you may ask, why is it so much so, is, is that we're talking about the law. The law, the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Covenant, and we're supposed to follow them. And, and yet, I would argue that there's more here uh, as we look at law in both the Old and New Testaments, and we're going to spend the next few minutes trying to understand what God intended as he starts in Exodus chapter 19 and moves forward. So beginning in Exodus 19, God outlines what constitutes right behavior for the Israelites. The Lord begins the narrative by giving Moses his justification for obedience. In other words, God is saying, this is the authority that I have over you. When in verse 4, he says, you yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Therefore, the justification for Israel's obedience is rooted in the mighty acts of God surrounding the Exodus. Verse 5 and 6 continue. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be a treasured possessor. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The laws that follow this passage are therefore a conditional set of behaviors intended to show obedience to and respect for God. Obedience will result in the blessing of fellowship as the Israelites will be considered holy and able to be in the presence of God. There are four introductory factors to understand about the law. First, from beginning to end, God takes the initiative in making the covenant. Mankind had no role. It was God alone who reaches out. The Lord saved the Israelites. He led them into the desert, and he saved them at the Sea of Reeds. And it was God who instructs Moses. Second, out of all the nations, God selects Israel for a unique position. Everything that God states about Israel points towards this being a type of restoration of the status that humanity lost through the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Third, the establishment of the covenant relationship is conditional on Israel's continued obedience to God. While obedience is critical, obedience by itself does not create the special covenant relationship. We must remember that it was or it is a loving response to what God in his grace does first. Finally, fourth, two sets of obligations are placed before the Israelites. The first set is the Decalogue or Ten Commandments that is given directly by God to the people of Israel. The second are a set of laws given to Moses recording the obligations of holy living entitled the Book of the Covenant. The nation of Israel is assembled at the base of Mount Sinai and God begins to speak to them from the top of the mountain. The people hear and tremble as God introduces himself to them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And let me digress for a second. We've heard that phrase in multiple le lectures, and we've already heard it twice here. Uh, that might be considered the central theme of Exodus as we look at um, it is all based that Israel is to respond because God acted first, out of his mighty hand, he brought them out of slavery in Egypt. Going on, the Lord follows the instruction with a list of stipulations that form the basis of Israel's covenant relationship with God. 
They are later termed the ten words in Hebrew, from which we derive the designation Decalogue or Ten Commandments. Their importance is further emphasized when God eventually inscribes them on two stone tablets. Alongside the principal obligations of the Decalogue, God through Moses also gives obligations that must be observed. Later, Moses records everything that the Lord has said in a document known appropriately as the Book of the Covenant. As it stands, it falls into five sections. The opening part focuses on issues regarding around divine presence and how the Israelites are to encounter God. Second, there is a long list of laws dealing with the various aspects of social life. The next part consists of moral rules or, re or requirements that highlight the exemplary behavior that God expects of his people, especially towards the underprivileged. Next are instructions regarding the observance of the Sabbath and religious holidays, and the final section outlines how God will act on behalf of the Israelites, enabling them to take possession of the land of Canaan. In a book that underlines God's passionate concern for justice through his rescue of the Israelites from Egypt, it is hardly surprising that a similar concern for justice should not dominate the covenant that he has established with the Israelites. Turning to the New Testament, it continues the unity of the same theme. Matthew 22 echoes this idea when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In Romans, the Apostle Paul adds a deeper understanding that the true purpose of the law then and now is not to show people how they could gain salvation through works, but just the opposite, that the law was designed to show the power of sin Essentially, that no one is able to keep the law, and therefore no one is able to earn salvation. These two examples demonstrate that the law has not changed between the Old and New Testaments, because both of these New Testament authors tie an understanding of the law back to the Pentateuch and the prophets. The law was always intended to bring an awareness of sin and mankind's inability to uphold the law. The point is to direct our attention in faith to God. Thanks for listening and have a great day.